DNT show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. friends with benefits <laughs> speaking of having a good time terry mm-hmm. dayton broke <laughs> the gnt show this is now the david mac <laughs> appreciation <laughs> hour <Twitter>. you asshole <laughs> <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much with his purple velvet cape and his crown i thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne i am awesome <laughs> Look what I have done! Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd crapped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show. That's right. And Joel on True, welcome to another GNT Supplemental Logs episode. This week, we have a very special guest from the world of Star Trek literature, the one David R. George III. Welcome, the one, sir. The one, the one David the R. George III? The third. I'm going to be the one, one if I'm the third. You're the one. Because <laughs> there's only one third, right? There can be only one. Okay. And as you hear, and if you look to my right, your left, there she is, resplendent in her, uh, I guess she had this toga left over from Rome, Terry. Uh, it wasn't Rome. It wasn't Rome? <laughs> All right. Well, I don't want to know that. And yeah, my it, left, your right, <laughs> have you ever seen a Klingon in such sad shape, ice pack taped to his head because of a little chip tooth? Oh, I've heard Ferengi wine less. Ceradium. Kapla. See, that's what you get for trying to use a Ferengi tooth sharpener, my dear. Oh, yeah. Th- those things are awful. They should come in with instruction manuals. Well, I found out the hard way that what I was using was an ear cleaner, and that's... <laughs> but anyway. They do come with manuals that just cost extra. <laughs> Which rule of acquisition is that? <laughs> I'm sure there's one to cover it. Profit I'm over people. I'm person. sure that's the one. Yeah. Oh, welcome, sir. It's really good to have you with us. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. One of my best lunches at Shore Leave was with you last year. That was a lot of fun. I have no Uh, independent recollection of that event. Of course you (laughs) don't. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, I, know that. I was going to um, say, I thought, I thought you guys were going to keep that quiet. <laughs> oh, stop it, all of you. Stop, I know. Scott Peters. Scott was there. It was anyway. No, actually, very glad you're here because I'm a huge fan of Typhon Pact, which you have a little bit of knowledge on. I do indeed. <laughs> a great deal of fun working on the Typhon Pact. I was going to say, you wrote Rough Beasts of Empire, correct? I did, I'm, and I'm still taking grief for it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I expected, actually. Nothing wrong with that. People have strong opinions. But it's got the Zenkathy. It's awesome. I do like the Zenkathy. That was a lot of fun, too. I mean, I didn't actually create them since they'd been mentioned before, but since we didn't know anything about them, I had wide latitude to describe them and create their culture as I wanted to. So I had a lot of fun with that. See, now and- that's got to that's gotta be really, really cool to be able to have the almost the free reign to actually flesh out a species in Star Trek, especially one that was so mysterious as the Zenkathy. It's funny because you run a risk in doing that because people, when they don't know something about, in this case, a species, but if they don't know something about a character, when you start fleshing out a character, or in this case, species, you start perhaps going against people's expectations. Ah. When, When people don't know... Sulu and Chekhov, for example, weren't really fleshed out very much in the original series. And, of course, they have been fleshed out in the novels. Well, when you start painting pictures of these characters that people have known for so long and have formed their own visions in their head of, you you sometimes work against that. And that, that, that can be a challenge. So 
But I, I actually like I like challenging myself, and I like challenging readers as well. So I don't really have that much of a problem with that. One of the things that we've talked about on the show is I'm a huge Christine Vell fan from the Next Generation novels and the Enterprise and then Into Titan. And one of the things that Terry like laughs at me about is I was upset when the comics came out and they had a representation of her because, no, that's not how I see her. Right, right. I know a lot of readers... I think, and even plenty of writers sort of envision how somebody looks using actors and actresses very often to, to try and cast the roles in their heads. I don't do that myself. I have mm-hmm. visions of what people look like. I can see characters, but for some reason, I never see them as actors or actresses that I know. I, they're just wholly new characters to me. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I write in much the same way, although on a fan level, but that's interesting. We're all writing on a fan level. It's some, <laughs> we're all fans. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Well, do you yeah, ever you should, find it? You should, do you ever you find see my it? My Gilmore actually? Girls fan fiction. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I won't even talk to you about his Gilmore Girls fan fiction. We're just going to keep walking on. Just keep walking. <laughs> do you ever find it limiting, however, to actually have to abide by some of the canon characters then? No. The, the short answer is no. Of course, there's a much longer answer, too. When I was <laughs> younger and I started reading poetry because I was forced to read poetry in school, I think was the first first time that I read it, I thought initially that writing poetry must be limiting because if you're writing specific form poetry, then you're obviously you have to try and fit words uh, in, in syllabic patterns uh, into lines. And it just it seemed like how could that possibly not limit you? I've come to believe that it really something like that really doesn't limit you because it just it may take you longer to find the right words, but the right words are still out there. And when I'm writing characters that already exist, I'm not writing them because I don't want to write them. And I'm not writing them usually with any sort of specific story that somebody's made me write. I won't use characters if they don't belong in the story. And really, that's how you get around it being limiting to you. You know, I know directors often say that 90% of directing a film is casting. And in a way, that's also true in in writing novels. I'm not going to have Captain Kirk in a story or Captain Sisko in a story that they don't belong in. I'm not going to have them have a major role. And in fact, my most recent novel came out in January. It's an original series novel called The Legions in Exile. And when I started writing that, it was an original series book, so I thought, okay, Kirk, Spock, McCoy. But as I got into the story, McCoy and Spock, although they're there, they don't make, they don't have a lot to do with the story, and so they don't appear a lot. So I'm not limited by them being there because I don't use them where they're not needed. Right. Right. Well, that's kind of interesting, though, because, you know, after the ideas of, you know, a a lot of the people that listen to our show are either aspiring writers or hobby writers and like to kind of glean the information from the authors that we interview. And, you know, when they run into problems of writing a canon character in their fan fiction or whatnot, they always like to hear whether or not somebody has the same problem or not. They do. So I I think that's cool. I think problems might arise if you try to force a character to do something that they wouldn't do or into a situation that they wouldn't be in. You can also certainly find great stories that way because what better way to explore a character than face them with some dilemma that they've never faced before. But in terms of the craft of it, the art of it, you don't want to use characters that aren't going to serve the material. You don't want to force them. Now, of course, you're not going to all of a sudden say that, oh, Captain Kirk's not the captain of the Enterprise. You have to have that. But if you even look at the series, you can see episodes where they put somebody off on a shell craft on some mission doing something. And so they weren't there for most of the episode. And right. part of that is because they didn't really belong in the episode. There was nothing there for them to do. So you just have to be careful in using the characters you have for the story that you're telling. And if they don't belong there, then that they shouldn't be there. Well, One of them... Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, talking about characters doing something. Now, you co-wrote a story in which... A character, one of the very, very few characters in the series I like, when Tuvok in Prime Factors came in the transporter room and said, you know, I'll be the one to violate the captain's orders. Now, that's a lot of fun specifically to me because I like Tuvok and there's not much about Voyager I'm a big fan of, but also because it really added a depth to the Tuvok character. Yeah, I 
would say a couple of things about that. One is that it was an early episode. It was the, depending on how you count the first episode of Voyager, it was the ninth or tenth episode of that first season. And so there wasn't a lot we knew about Tuvok. So I could have him violate the captain's orders and make it seem reasonable because in Tuvok's case, because it was logical to do that. And for me and for my writing partner at the time, the reason to do that entire episode was that sort of betrayal of Janeway by Tuvok, but for seemingly logical or reasonable reasons. And that was fun to explore. And the goal, of course, was to try and layer some new new characteristics onto Tuvok and to learn about him and learn about how learn about his relationship with Janeway. And hopefully that would, after that episode, play out in other ways. But unfortunately, it, it really didn't. It sort of just kind of stopped right there. But it would have been nice to see there be more repercussions to that than just what we saw in that episode. Well, that's kind of the problem with <laughs> Voyager, is that a lot of things like that were left hanging. I think it was just part and parcel of the episodic nature of the show to begin with. It wasn't just Voyager either. There were others that you know didn't get to jump into the depth of storytelling a lot just because they were limited into the episodic nature of the show. So I, If you look at the original series, it's really interesting be, to me anyway, because there were a couple of times... And by a couple, I think I mean exactly two. It might, <laughs> it might be three, where they made references to previous episodes, and that's a small number, really. Certainly, with the serial nature of shows like Deep Space Nine, but even of Next Generation, they would, in current television, current in the '90s and the 2000s, you know, in, in modern day television, as opposed to back in the '60s, we look at shows sort of holistically, and we we have shows that are serial in nature, but even ones that aren't still take into account what's come before. Back in the 60s, they didn't really do that. And for me, watching those original episodes where they did make reference to an earlier scene and in some other episode, I loved that. Maybe because it was so rare, but it also made me feel that the series was a whole sort of entity, not just episodic in nature, not just little bits and pieces here and there. You know, you didn't get a lot of that back in the day. You get it now, and it's kind of cool. Of course, you can overdo it as well, but it's nice to have that continuity, I think. Well, one of the things I kind of wanted to touch on real quick was and and please forgive me if I'm wrong but I don't believe I am. You wrote a story for the Captain's Table Anthology. I did. Okay. It also happens to be probably one of my favorite tales from that book and that book happens to be one of my favorite books ever. Everybody knows that I prefer the short tales or the novellas or the short stories more so than a lot of the novels, namely because you're allowed to kind of pluck at the heartstrings a little bit more than you can. You have to make a run for the money kind of a thing. So you must but, you must hate my work because I tend to write a little bit long. No, actually, <laughs> I don't. I love your work. And so much so, this one story that you wrote, which was called Iron and Sacrifice, That's it. involved Demora Sulu, correct? What was your... I have to ask, how did you get inspired to write that story? I was invited to write for The Captain's Table by Keith DeCandido, who was editing the volume. So that was nice. And Keith, I believe Keith came to me and said, do you want to write a Demora Sulu story? And because I had left her as captain of the Enterprise at the end of a novel that I wrote called Serpents Among the Ruins. And so Keith said, hey, you want to do a Demora Sulu story? And I said, great, that'd be fantastic. As far as the actual story itself is concerned, the inspiration, I think, was twofold. One... I started out with Iron and Sacrifice thinking what I typically think when I begin a writing project, which is, what do I feel like talking about? What is the theme that I want to explore, theme or themes that I want to explore? And I was actually talking to my wife, Karen, about that, saying exactly that. What do I want to write about? And she said, why don't you write about, I don't think she said loss necessarily, but she said, she said something. And it, it certainly triggered the underlying themes of what turned out to be Iron and Sacrifice. I also knew when I wanted, was going to write a, a captain's table story that I didn't want it to be something simple, just telling a story. That's awfully fun, but I, I kind of wanted to do more than that. And so I thought about doing a story within a story, and I thought, you know, that's not even complicated enough. I would really like to do a story within a story within a story. <laughs> <laughs> Which can really mess with your tenses when you're writing something. But <laughs> that was sort of the way that that all came about. The way I, I kind of dove into that project was thinking about, I'm going to write Demora, and that's because Keith invited me to, and I and I, I wanted to, what my wife had inspired me to think about in terms of theme, and then wanting to, to put together a relatively complex story. In fact, the story 
ended up being not a short story, but a novella, just a right. term length. But, so it wasn't exactly a short piece, which is something but, I've tagged with, not writing short. But <laughs> no, I mean, I, it, every word was was wonderful. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, it was, no, I You're mean, the it's an- only... He's the anti-date. For everybody who may not own a copy of Tales from the Captain's Table, it's really not that long. I mean, it may be technically novella length, but it's less than 70 pages, I think in the book so it's a really easy easy read (laughs) and not just that but it's gripping and as everybody knows I am probably one of the most hypercritical critics about how women in Star Trek are written let's just put it this way it's not just in Star Trek (laughs) (laughs) no it doesn't matter I'm hypercritical of how women are written but I'm hypercritical more so about how they're written in Trek to be honest with you because you know there's certain desires to more Yes, exactly. Yes. The more right. It's, it's, there's a higher bar. <laughs> there's yeah, no doubt. I get, that. I get that. But you wrote her quite which compel- is why was quite which compelling is, as a character. Now, Dave, tell her. She refuses because she thinks it's all sex and grotesque to watch Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica. If she watched it, do you not think that as critical as she is as how women are written, she would love how they're written in that series? Dick, having never seen Battlestar Galactica, I <laughs> really comment on that. <laughs> I Son can, of a bitch. I can oh. tell you, I'm a terrible geek. I can tell you this, though. I think Ron Moore is a very, very talented writer and a very talented showrunner. And it would not surprise me if Battlestar Galactica was a very good show. I, and that's what I will say is that I don't doubt that the, com- the characters of Battlestar Galactica are very compelling and very, very well written. It's just that I have, like I said, I'm a hypersensitive person when it comes to certain visualizations of violence and or especially against women. And of course, I made the mistake of watching probably what was the worst 10 minutes of anything in the show. (laughs) And I wasn't able to get back into it. No, I have the same problem with Game of Thrones. I have the same problem with Walking Dead. To me, it's the pure visualization. Mind you, I can read that stuff without a problem. Books put a safety net in front of my psyche that television and, and movies do not. So that's just a personal thing. So Nick gets upset thinking that I refuse to watch BSG because I think it's bad. No, I just can't handle the violence and stuff like that. Oh, and that's just a matter of taste. Uh, oh, that violent. Oh, my God. And I uh, have I mentioned that I'm a bad geek, Walking Dead, never seen it, and uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones, never seen it. Although I'm a huge George R.R. R. Martin fan, but don't watch a lot of television, oddly enough. So. Well, Terry, Terry gets on me because I haven't read or seen The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. Yeah, so, see, I'm, not, so I'm not a good it, geek either. You're not a good geek either. There you go. <laughs> if you want to start talking about Downton Abbey, then I'm with you. But otherwise, All right. I see, fall, I fall short. Style. I have to say, I do appreciate you mentioning Iron and Sacrifice because for whatever reason, that's not a work of mine that I hear much about. I don't get a lot of comment about it. And it's actually one of my favorites. I, I really enjoyed working on it, and I think it holds up pretty well. It, it's just, it's a very personal story. You know, it's not a, not a lot of starship battles and phasers and aliens and all of that kind of thing. It's just a very personal story. And to me, that is sort of at the core of Star Trek. People always wonder why Star Trek is popular, how it could have lasted for so long, but I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's because it presents a, an inclusive and positive view of the future and because it has characters that people love. Mm-hmm. It was okay. just, it was an extremely moving story for me, and I just want to thank you for writing it because it was beautiful. Well, I thank you for reading it, for saying that. I, that delights me. I love, love, love happy readers. <laughs> well, <laughs> speaking of happy readers, I love one of your books and, you know, the way you write women. When you wrote Twilight, Bella Swan, how did you come up with <laughs> the... No? That's not the same... <laughs> I don't bad geek. If I had if I, <laughs> if I could kick him under the table, I would, but <laughs> No, but the the Mission Gamma Twilight and I'm kind of rereading uh, not rereading, reading the DS9 relaunch because I hadn't read them yet and there's so much with the as we talked about before, you wrote for Typhon Pact and there's characters in Typhon Pact that I'm now being introduced to by reading the DS9 novels. So when you talk about writing characters and having this established universe, but then you also got to work with characters that you created or that are new to the series like Elias Vaughn. Can you talk about that? 
Well, I, I love Elias Vaughn. I, I know what you're talking about. I When I was writing Twilight, there's two storylines through that. One takes place on Bajor and Deep Space Nine, and the other takes place in the Gamma Quadrant, where Defiant, Elias Vaughn has taken De- Defiant out on an exploratory mission for, for three months. And I didn't, and actually within that exploration into the Gamma Quadrant, there's a, a separate storyline that takes place on a world there with three characters, and I, I didn't realize until actually I until I'd finished the novel, that that huge chunk of the book that took place in the Gamma Quadrant on this planet had three characters that were all literature-only characters. And it just never occurred to me while I was writing it that maybe this isn't a good idea, maybe I need to have one of this television series regulars on this planet just to keep readers interested. I don't think you keep readers interested by sort of catering to their lowest need. Oh, I'd agree with that, right. Yeah, I mean, you want to, I mean, in some sense, you, I, like I said, I like challenging readers, but between those two things, catering to their lowest desires and, and challenging them, between those two things, there's plenty of room to move. And really what you want to do is just tell a good story. That's always where I start when I'm writing something. I don't start by saying I want to write good Star Trek. I start by saying I want to write a good story. Secondarily, I want it to be good Star Trek, if it's a Star Trek story, obviously. But I just want to tell a good story. And so if I've got three characters on a planet and they were all characters created in the literature, so what? If you write them well, if you're telling a good tale, then that shouldn't matter to readers. And hopefully it doesn't. You know, hopefully I can meet that challenge if it does bother some readers that there aren't some of the television characters in those sequences. Well, and that's part of the fun of Deep Space Nine, not only on screen, but also in the novels to me is this... It's so bizarre because this stationary object, this station, actually is a much bigger universe in the novels and on screen than, to me, the ship set novels and shows are. Well, if you look at the TV show, you know, as you mentioned, I co-wrote the story for an episode of Voyager, and the production staffs, the writing staffs, had a rule, a guideline about showing alien species, alien civilizations, and that rule was two rooms, four guys. If you're going to show an entire alien civilization, you could do it in two rooms and with four characters. Or at least you had to, because they had budgets. They couldn't create gigantic sets. They couldn't create numerous sets. They couldn't hire thousands of characters, thousands of extras. They couldn't do any of that. In the novels, we can do that. We can have as many sets as we want, as many characters as we want. And so we necessarily have the luxury of an added degree of complexity. We can add all sorts of things. In fact, we can blow things up and create things that you couldn't really do, certainly on a budget, in a television show. So that is a bonus for us who are writing the the literature, the Star Trek literature. I guess I've just always felt that for somehow the universe in Deep Space Nine just seemed much bigger, even though it was more confined, because maybe it was because of the characterizations of so many of the secondary characters were were alien. I'm not sure that Deep Space Nine or the sets, the ships are, that one's more confined than the other. some regard, you've got ships that are able to go places so that the expansion of the, the environments that you're viewing or reading things in, as opposed to Deep Space Nine, which, as you say, is just a sort of stationary set. But we've ranged very far from Deep Space Nine. There's plenty that goes on on the station itself, but we've been to Bajor, we go to Cardassia, we go into the Gamma Quadrant. There are all sorts of places that we go. So no matter what you're writing, whether it's on a ship or whether it's on the space station, no matter whether it's Next Generation or Deep Space Nine or Voyager, it all depends on your imagination, I suppose, as a writer. Try and expand what we know. It also depends on what it is you're trying to write. In the story that Terry mentioned, Iron and Sacrifice, it's a very personal story. It doesn't need a whole lot of different settings and things like that. So you can tell a story that's pretty self-contained. You can tell a story that takes place in one room and it could be compelling. You just need good storytelling. You need to know what you're doing, what you want to say, and then you have to say it in a way that entertains people. I couldn't agree more. And there's a lot of, again, a lot of great advice in there about making sure that you know you can tell a, a compelling story or a great story first and then make sure it's a if you're writing Star Trek is to go from Star Trek from there but it should be story first. Gee I wish movie script writers would pay attention to that more. Are um, you thinking of anybody in particular Terry? Not Bob necessarily. Or C and... Not necessarily. <laughs> 
with modern day, you know, television and, and even movie production techniques, special effects, uh, they're able to crank out a lot more fleshed out world, so to speak, than they used to. I guess my question is, is if it presented with an opportunity to venture into writing a, a new show, a new Star Trek show for television or whatnot, do you think that the storytelling could be more expansive, more massive than what they were. Uh, uh, well, back in the it, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by expansive uh, and more than what they were. I think that Next Generation was a terrific series. I certainly love Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine is a very different series than Next Generation. Obviously, it's more serial in nature. The environment is more alien in Deep Space Nine. It's got a lot of different things going on. I think one of the things that's changed television over the years is technology but not special effects so much as computers, as opposed to typewriters. Back when you, I'm sure we've all, you guys have all seen what a, a teleplay looks like. Yes, it's very, I have. They're formatted very specifically. There's actually not a lot of writing on a page, but you've got the dialogue separate from description. There's not a lot of description. And, you know, they're very specifically formatted. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when you were writing television, it wasn't that easy to write these pages in these formats. I mean, you had to move the typewriter writer roll around and the, and the tabs and everything. And that limited the number of times you could rewrite something. And now with word processors, you can rewrite things many, many, many more right. times. Now, that's not always a good thing. You can write something good and then by rewriting, make it bad. But for the people who can write and who do write well, being able to revise can be a great boon. And I think that's one of the reasons why you get more complex television today than you did 40 or 50 years ago. It is at least in part because of technology. It's certainly a lot of creative things as well. People's visions of what television can be have grown, but thankfully they've got the tools now in, in the computer word processors to actually be able to make more complex stories and craft more complex stories. I'm sure that any new Star Trek television series would come down to the writing and obviously the casting and the directing, things like that, but no matter what, you have to start with the written word. It's very difficult to elevate a bad script to a good movie or a good piece of television. I think you can elevate it a little bit, but I don't think you can make a bad script into a great TV episode or a great movie. You can make, you can certainly make a great script into a bad movie or a bad episode. <laughs> but it's hard to go the other way. I think you need to fire on all cylinders as, you know, if you're going to really reach for the stars, as it were. But if you don't start with a, a good plan, a good document, then you're not going to go very far. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Well, we're going to kind of move on from here just because we all know that, oh, yes, Nick, you were going to say something? No, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. I, it sounded for a minute there like you were. I apologize. That coming in August, I believe, of this year is the first book of Star Trek The Fall, the series The Fall, of which you got to write the first book called Revelation and Dust. Yep, that's me. And it's actually a <laughs> September book, which means it'll probably be available in some places at the end of August. Okay. But it's actually a September book. But yes, I'm writing uh, Revelation and Dust as the first of a five-book series that have some fantastic writers behind me. Una McCormick, Dave Mack, James Swallow, and Dayton Ward, which is those four writers, that's a murderer's row of writers. <laughs> just all terrific. In one know. case, literally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Mac, I always call Mac the angel of death. And, no, no, I always call Mac the prince of death, and he says that's the angel of death, and I always say, look, I know you, you're no angel. <laughs> uh, so, people, if you don't get to go to shore leave, you miss so much fun with this kind of thing nonstop. <laughs> The good news is is that the book is finally available for pre-order through pretty much most of the major booksellers, including Amazon. So you can pre-order the book now. But it's my understanding that I'm not exactly sure, of course. We're not going to ask you what happens in the books because we're not that stupid. Okay. But it is, <laughs> it is my understanding, though, that it will take place kind of in the next generation, the Deep Space Nine prime universe time periods, correct? That time period, yes. It takes okay. place in, that time, in those time periods. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we we've had James Swallow on, who's always a blast. Yeah. And Dayton Ward, and they've kind of given little, just enough to make us go, oh come on, can you give us anything, anything? Don't JJ us. Can you give us anything <laughs> about what this is about? It's about uh, four hundred pages. Ah! 
But I'm too shy. I'm actually work. I actually go ahead. I'm working on the novel almost as we speak. I had to stop working on it to do this interview. I'm actually I'm at the copy edit stage, so I'm going over the copy edited manuscript. I'll turn that in actually probably later today, and from there it's just you know I'll get the what we call the first pass pages back in a probably in th- three or four weeks, and then the second pass pages. Anyway, I'm, I'm through. I'm going through the process of it. What can I tell you about it? I can tell you that we've tried very much to make this five book series a series of five books, which I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but all I mean by that is that my story tells a complete story, and so does everybody else's. Together, they obviously make sort of a sixth story, an overarching story that brings everything together, and there are through lines that start in my book and that continue through the the other books, but we all have plots that begin and end in our books, so that, I think, is a something you need to know. Yours is Deep Space Nine, correct? It is indeed. Okay. Because Dayton, if I remember, his is TNG, and James Swallows is Titan, which I, I love, and David Mack, I believe he told me, because I saw him at Farpoint, it's uh, DS9 and the Aventine. Yes. Okay, and, and Una is the Garrick story. It's a, it, it's a, oh, oh so Because man. the thing about it is the fall just has such a... Oh, you're killing me! I know, um, I know that I've seen that people, readers have speculated about the fall, about, you call something the fall that kind of implies that something actually, I don't know, falls, and people wonder if that's going to be the type of pact, if it's going to be the Federation, if it's going to be any number of other things, and I can tell you that I don't think anybody's figured out what's going on. I, I, it's all speculation, and I don't, I, I haven't seen anybody speculate reasonably about what it is and and nor should you it doesn't it doesn't matter it's because <laughs> you do know that's all we're gonna do now <laughs> well no that's perfect fine I, yes that's what... it's actually about september in vermont right <laughs> there you right. go my call is about the, the leaves changing color <laughs> Every... nan, nan we were... goes to vermont <laughs> we were initially going to call it the autumn <laughs> I can tell you that my book is largely Deep Space Nine, and here's a spoiler alert. It's the new Deep Space Nine, since the old Deep Space Nine is, well, gone. (laughs) And the new Deep Space Nine is... I've enjoyed being on the new space station. And, There's people uh, in our audience go, whose heads just exploded who haven't read about that I know, yet. I know. Okay, well, then you can fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's good. We don't, no, we're, we're, that's good. That's well, people, people, go, people go crazy when they hear stuff like that, that something like that's happened. And I can understand why. I mean, the space station itself is sort of a character. But I wouldn't have done it if it didn't serve the story. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was part of the story that I was trying to tell. What I'm still trying to figure out is how when I actually pitched the destruction of Deep Space Nine in a series called Deep Space Nine, nobody said, yeah, you know what, you can't do that. We kind of need one of those. <laughs> well, if they blow up the Enterprise, I mean, I was going to say, fly, it's not like you, know. you can't rebuild it bigger and better and cleaner, and you don't have all those rats in it and everything. I'm sorry. I... Holes. And, and you'll have things. to wait with, with lips on it. Yeah I, yeah, I still don't understand the notions of Cardassian comfort and... Uh, and <laughs> Uh, yeah. Lizard. Yeah, right, yeah, right. So, yeah. Well, it, well I actually, so you're you're a good person to ask this in because our show, whether it's our live show that we do on Sundays or our supplemental logs that we do like this, spoilers, as you said, you know, people get upset about. What do you think? Like Destiny, don't you think it's a little late now to call anything we discuss in Destiny a spoiler? I don't think I would talk yet about Terry. What's the series you're reading right now? Oh, cha- Cold um, yeah, Cold Equations. Cold Equations. I still think that's too soon, but if we want to discuss, you know, Plagues of, not Plagues of Night, Rough Beasts of Empire. It's been, what, three years, two years? What is your thought as 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 an author on that? I, I, it's all. I'm pretty sensitive to spoilers of my work. I know that in a review of Plagues of Night, somebody, a particular reviewer, revealed the ending in his oh. first sentence, and I thought, yeah, that doesn't strike me as fair to the readers who are looking forward to this and want to read it. It's not fair to me, who worked very hard to make this this 
you know, good, solid ending. And I don't like spoilers. I also don't like spoilers in my own life. If I haven't read something or I haven't seen a movie, I don't want to know how it ends. And the thing is, if it's a movie that's 15 years old, okay, I can't expect people to avoid spoilers just because I haven't seen a movie or read this book in 15 years. But I still don't like it when things are spoiled for me before I get to see them or read them. So, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about Revelation of Dust, the novel that I have coming out, without saying that, hey, it involves the new Deep Space Nine. And when you say the new Deep Space Nine, people are going to go, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What happened to the old Deep Space Nine? Well, go read Plagues of Night and find out. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I cannot completely commiserate with people who have things spoiled for them before they get a chance to enjoy them, even if it's well after the fact. But if it's well after the fact, you really can't expect people not to start talking about things. I think it is way too soon, way too close to Dave Mack's Cold Equations Cold trilogy Equation. to start talking about what happened in there. Yeah. Mm. But, it, you know, it's hard. Well, hopefully you get a lot of people who know about it who can talk about it. So but, and right. and let that I have, listen to everybody when these books come out. Buy them immediately <laughs> <laughs> and read them at once. <laughs> Well, and that, that, that leads to something that you and I talked about at that lunch that you say. Hello? You were Skyping there Which, a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can you repeat your question? Yeah, it, that was a good transition to something that you and I talked about at the, the lunch that you said that never happened. <laughs> but your thoughts on the effects because of ebooks, we were talking about the piracy issue and what happened to you. Well, I tell you this, that I don't like piracy. That people tend, I think, to believe that piracy is something of a victimless crime or that the victim is this big, rich corporation. And certainly corporations are victims. When somebody pirates my book, Simon & Schuster is a victim because they don't get the revenue. But I'm a much bigger victim. I mean, in a way, I'm a much smaller victim, but it impacts me in a much bigger way because I've seen at least, I think, 30 or 40,000 copies of Rough Beasts of Empire were illegally downloaded. That's a lot of revenue. That's a lot of royalties taken away from me. And yeah, I despise it. I work very hard at what I do. People would not think that stealing my car was okay. I don't know why they think stealing my work is okay. There's this notion or lack of a notion about intellectual property. A lot of times people don't don't have the feel of intellectual property as real property, but it is. And I'm particularly disturbed by readers, people who I feel should know better, who defend piracy, who say that the ebooks aren't really, I don't know, they think the ebooks are too expensive. So instead of buying the novels or whatever that pirate the, the ebooks, and it's like you can rationalize it any way you want, but it's still stealing. And it's stealing not just from the publisher, it's stealing from the writer. And it's a much, much bigger deal for me than it is for Simon and Schuster. Although in the aggregate, it's a really big deal for Simon and Schuster as well. Right. Because it's not just my novel that's being stolen. I have nothing against ebooks. I love books. I've got so many bookcases in my office, in my house. My wife and I have books everywhere. But I actually have a Kindle now and I read a lot of books on my Kindle because I have no place to put more actual books. That's exactly right. (laughs) And I don't want to get rid of the ones that I have and love. I want to keep them. So I actually read a lot of stuff on Kindle. So I don't think I don't have anything particularly against ebooks. I just don't like the fact that it makes it a lot easier for people to steal my work and to really steal my revenue, my money from what I've produced. It's really easy to see from my point of view. It's not so easy for, I guess, a lot of readers to see that it's uh, a big deal. I think that there's a misunderstanding as well, probably in the general public. And it's not just the book authors or any kind. It it runs the gamut with all forms of entertainment that are, are now being delivered in an electronic format that there's an idea that just because you are a writer that somehow you're making millions of dollars of people do not comprehend how little money really is involved in right. writing well frankly it, it doesn't even matter you're right I, you know nobody but there's an automatic assumption that there's that somebody is wealthy and therefore can afford to lose whatever it is and that's the mental block we need to get through these people's heads and say look you do not understand you are stealing it is wrong it well, is, on its face, it shouldn't matter what the person is making or not making. It's just flat out wrong. Well, I think it's wrong no matter what. Nobody's making millions of dollars writing Star Trek novels, to be sure. But, <laughs> but 
I don't think that even if we were, yeah, maybe it would impact us less, but it's still wrong to steal. It's, exactly. Stealing is stealing. The fact is it does impact us in a large way because we're not making millions of dollars, but it's just, it's stealing. It, 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 people just don't think of it as stealing. And, and part of the time it's because people don't want to think it's stealing because if they right. did think it was stealing, they wouldn't be able to do it with a clean conscience. Right. So I agree. I, it's unfortunate. I, I hope that I know people are against uh, the digital rights management and trying to, to protect how things are copied and they can't be copied and all of that. I wish there was some way out there that we could effectively do that because people shouldn't be able to just steal things. That's unfortunate. Well, to kind of change things up a little bit, Nick, do you have the questionnaire ready? I do. Now, do you watch Inside the Actor's Studio at all? I have seen it. Okay, we have our own set of James Lipton-type questions that he stole from the, I believe it was the Frenchman, but these are our, our questions for authors. All right. First is, what is your favorite of the Trek series? How am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> Honestly. I mean, I'm writing in all of these series. I'll give you a, sort of a canned answer. It's only canned because I've said it several times, but I found it in trying to answer this question. The series I typically like the most is the one that I happen to be writing at the time, which right now would be Deep Space Nine. But I have a soft spot for the original series because that's where it all began. I thought Next Generation was a great way to renew the series and continue it. It's really, really hard to pick a favorite. Okay, fine. We'll let him off. <laughs> <laughs> if you could be any species in Trek other than human, what species would you be? Oh, man. <laughs> well, uh, we didn't say they were appropriate or, you know, reasonable questions. We just... Or easy. Jeez, I, I wish I had known these questions. I would have studied them in advance. If I could be a species, but, uh, let me see. Mm, I don't know. Deltons seem awfully fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's our first uh, Delton. Right? That's a first Delton, right on. Yeah, uh -oh, would you want to be bald? Yeah. <laughs> You stepped out there for oh, a moment. That, that sounds like a loaded question. Because, you know, I know I rock the ball. Be bald and have that kind of a fun life. I'm just saying. Hey, yeah. I might be Delton then for all, you know. <laughs> that would explain a lot, Nick. Thank it you. really would. <laughs> if you were given an opportunity to write an open-ended series based on one character in Star Trek, who would it be? Star Trek on television, in the movies, or in the literature? I don't think one, it mattered. One character in Star Trek. In all that it is. <laughs> You know, two characters come to mind. Well, maybe three. <laughs> Man, these aren't easy <laughs> questions. My initial reaction was Elias Vaughn. I really, really, really like the character of Elias Vaughn. My second response, though, was Kira, Kira Norris. I love the character of Kira. And then I thought, well, James Kirk, of course. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I me. like those answers, though. Those are great. Those are good good choices. All right, this one's a little easier for you. What author, when their new books come out, do you, quote, run out to get when they're released? And this, any, of course, any author. Any genre, yeah. Any, uh, John any, Irving. Uh, Irving, okay. Anybody ever heard of John Irving? Oh, I are told, you kidding? I told you I'm a bad geek. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm a big John Irving fan. I love Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I love Tom Robbins. I have a lot of authors. I just read, well, geez, Khaled Hosseini, who wrote The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons. Huge fan. Terrific writer. I don't read a lot of science fiction. And when I do, a lot of it tends to be sort of the classic stuff, The Stars by Destination by Alfred Bester and things like that. But I do read a lot of mainstream and literature and classic literature. I'll go back and read Moby Dick and The Red Badge of Courage and things like that. In terms of Star Trek authors, I'm going to add a part B to your question. There's some really terrific people writing Star Trek right now, and not least of all the four that I talked about who, who are writing the fall novels after mine. I just think Mac is a terrific wordsmith. Una is a great writer. She's great with characters. James Swallow knows that. Right? He's terrific. And, and Dayton Ward. They're all really just solid, solid writers. And, and better than solid. They're they're really good. So I have no problem. I love reading their stuff as well. All right. An addendum question. What, do you have a favorite John Irving book? Yeah. They're all so well, quirky. I, I love uh, A Prayer for Owen Meany. It may be oh. my favorite book ever. I used to be, there was a book of Irving's, an early book called The Water Method Man that I absolutely loved. I loved The Hotel New Hampshire, The Cider House Rules, A Son of the Circus is spectacular. I'm a big John Irving fan, but really I think yeah. Eric okay. Bonini stands out for me. I've read The Cider House Rules and yeah, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you read Caleb Carr at all? The Alienist and the Angel of Darkness? 
I read The Aliens. Yeah, I loved that book. I just thought that was such a phenomenal book. So, I, sorry, I, got off on a squirrel there. Nothing wrong with that. I, I liked that book. There were some things about it that didn't quite jibe for me. I don't I don't remember exactly what. I liked it. I didn't love it. I liked it. And I didn't I know he's got a follow up to the alienist, but I didn't read it. Yeah, the Angel of Darkness. Right. I, the, would you recommend it, I would. It's subtitled the Dave Max story. <laughs> no, I, I So everybody dies is what you're saying. Everybody dies. No, I would. It, it's a very logical follow up to the alienist. Did you like the alienist better or the Angel of Darkness? Uh the alienist. Okay. Because right. it, I had never read something so atmospheric. It is very atmospheric, I will say that. Yeah, I, in fact, I loved seeing New York in that time period in the late 1800s. was fantastic. Actually, you know, Dave Mack wrote an urban fantasy called... The Calling. The Calling, yeah. which takes I've, place in... Uh, I've given out about 15 copies of that. <laughs> Fantastic. That book deserves some attention. Dave's such a good writer, and that book creates a, a new mythos, which is, is really interesting. But it also it came to mind because it really uses New York as a, a wonderful setting, almost as a, a character in the novel. And he, Dave just does a, a great job of setting the stage in that novel. I really enjoyed that. And I hope that it, just by mentioning it, gets some more attention out there because Dave deserves it. The book deserves it. At Farpoint Convention, uh, you know Kelly Metting, the author, correct? I do not. Oh, okay. Yeah, she writes urban fantasy, and I gave her a copy of The Calling <laughs> because she writes urban fantasy. And so Dave signed it for her, which was a lot of fun. I'm but not... speaking of this, is there a genre that you haven't written or published but would love to try? You know, as I mentioned, I really mostly read mainstream fiction. I don't really read a lot of science fiction anymore. And I, I think to whatever extent my Star Trek novels are popular at all, it might have to do with the fact that I kind of tend to write that way. I kind of tend to write sort of almost from a mainstream drama kind of viewpoint. And really, I think I would like to just do that, right? Mainstream fiction. In fact, I've started a project of my own, and hopefully one day I'll get that finished. Things like urban fantasy don't really interest me. I don't know. I just It's mostly mainstream drama for me. How about a, something in a superhero realm? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I grew up reading Marvel comics, so I'm a big Spider-Man fan and Fantastic Four and the Incredible Hulk and the Mighty Thor and everybody else in that universe. So I certainly would enjoy writing some of those, I'm sure, but they've been pretty well trod the last couple of decades, so I'm not sure that there's much room to move in there. And, and while it would be fun, I'm sure, I kind of, again, just would probably tend more toward mainstream drama. I think the thing that appeals to me about Star Trek is that even though the show takes place on a, on a starship or on a space station, even though that there are plenty of aliens around and there are ray guns and cool science fiction gimmicks all around. It really, there are stories about people. There are cautionary tales sometimes. There are morality tales. That's the way Star Trek was born, and I think that's the way Star Trek is when it's at its best. And I think that really appeals to me as a reader, as a viewer, and actually as a writer as well. I know he takes a lot of heat now, but I think something, when I was thinking superhero, because of your writing and your style, uh, Damalon's yep. Unbreakable, which people... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Watch me for a yeah. moment. I was thinking of something like, because of your style and of M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable, which to me is my favorite movie of his, which is a superhero movie, but you don't realize it until the end. I think Unbreakable was an interesting, I almost want to say experiment, because it really was an attempt, I think, to create a superhero film in as realistic a way as possible. I, I'm not sure how well it succeeded at that, but it was certainly an interesting experiment. Well, it, Heroes did come out a few years later, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. And if I had seen it, I could talk to you about that. <laughs> He's a bad geek, Mike. Remember, they told you, bad, bad geek. That's okay. I haven't <laughs> seen it either. That was just because it was on Bad Night for me. I sit in shore leave and talk with Mac and all the other writers and, and fans, uh, readers as well. And I just don't know so much of what you're talking about. I mean, I'm aware of Heroes, but I just, right. I, that's as far as it goes. I'm aware of Battlestar Galactica. I have some knowledge of things, but not from having watched it. And it's not because I resist just watching any of these things. I just don't watch a lot of television series. I'm a big movie fan, so I watch a lot of film, mm. and I read a lot. I don't know. I don't get that invested in television series. Every now and then, something will spark my interest. I mean, I actually, in terms of genre stuff, I actually did watch Lost, but I watched it after it had gone off the air. 
enough people <laughs> said something to me about it that I said fine, and I, my wife and I actually got the the series on DVD from Netflix and watched it and enjoyed it very much. But I, we also learned that the way to watch television shows is to wait for them to end and then watch them at your own. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that's I would I, have to agree with you on that. That's what I did with Rome. <laughs> it just made, it's just you don't have to wait for the next week or even the next season. Mm-hmm. You just be able to go through it, and it's in some ways much more enjoyable that way. I don't think I would have liked Lost had I watched it while it was on the air because I would have had to endure huge lengths of time between right. cliffhangers. So. Yeah, I'm not sure that that would have worked out for me, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I am a, a bad, bad geek. Well, in, in that vein, then, let's say you're the star, sh- the captain of a starship in Starfleet. What is the name of your starship? The USS Enterprise. What else would it be? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You know, he's the first person who. I know. I was just going to say, he's the first person that said that. I mean, you're I, coming up with a lot of original answers. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things I like, because I'm a bad geek, one of the things I like, although this Enterprise is a pretty geeky answer, I would say. One of the things I love doing, one of the little tiny things you love doing in a novel is being able to name starships. That's kind of a fun thing to do. But I have this responsibility oriented personality, even from a writing standpoint standpoint where there are so many starship names out there, so many starships out there that I I resist creating new ones because it just seems ridiculous. No, we can't have 50 million ships in Starfleet. So I tend to, but although, you know, since Matt destroyed half the fleet or whatever. <laughs> I, well, I, I was also going to say, obviously, you, you don't play Star Trek online. Uh, yeah. Mike, you <laughs> took it right out of my mouth. I was going to yeah. say, for your own health, then don't go into Star Trek online. Whatever you do, don't go to Star Trek online, because the names of the ships got, will... I, I passed one today. It was the USS Pink Fuzzy Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You know, I kind of, when I do Starship names, I try and keep in the spirit of them. So if, this isn't a Starship, but a runabout. They've all, always been named after rivers. So I, I'm not going to all of a sudden name after something other than a river. So I try and, and if, if there are a bunch of starships that are named, you know, Enterprise and Perseverance and whatever, I'm going to try and keep it in that vein of this sort of positive characteristic of humanity for a name. I, it's funny when I, when I'm, sometimes when I'm looking for a starship and I'll either look to create a new starship or I'll look for one that already exists, I'll, I'll end up either looking through the books or I'll end up in the encyclopedia or I'll end up memory alpha or memory beta online. And when I end up on memory beta and I have an idea for a starship name and I go look at it, I can't tell you how many times I've, oh, this, this would be a great ship to use. And I realize, oh, yeah, that's because I already created it in this other <laughs> I think if you look at memory beta, if you look up the USS New York, I'm from New York. I was born and raised in New York City. If you go look at memory beta for the USS New York, it's had several appearances, but they're only in my novels. <laughs> That's surprising, actually. Yeah, you Well, like- when I name my ships in Star Trek Online, I kind of, well, I've always had the USS Gettysburg. That's my main ship. But your name, I had a series of ships. My science officer is currently on the USS K-Rad. Before that, he was on the USS Marco Palmieri. <laughs> Before, yeah, that was my little nod. To- it's true. Well, don't name anything the USS Dave Mack, because it'll just get destroyed. And- I was going to say. Yeah, no, I couldn't do that. Up. And I trust that you, whenever you use the USS Gettysburg, you bring it in from the north. <laughs> Very good. Would the U.S. Dave Mack mean, wouldn't it herald the destruction of whatever Actually, it's he, going into? He has a Klingon character named D apostrophe M-A-K. <laughs> he really does. And it really is I, a day to die for him. And instead of firing photon torpedoes, I fire my Max. <laughs> now, do you have a favorite adjective? If so, do you overuse it? And is there an adjective you loathe? I could draw Max ire by saying Stygian. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. Wait a minute. Didn't, who said that? Didn't somebody just say that to us? Just recently, yeah. That was David Gerald, wasn't it? It was David Gerald. I think it was. <laughs> so much for origin. No, it's... <laughs> Somebody took Dave Mack to task for using that adjective, and uh, he didn't appreciate it. So, But, of course, I also told people to go get the calling, so I, I got a pass on that. A favorite <laughs> adjective? Uh, not for, uh, you mean in writing? And, yeah. Uh, yes. and, oh, yeah, you would, because do, do I overuse it? I don't think so. Um, you know, overusing words is easy to do. 
you know, there are words like said, he said, she said, that you'll use 500, 600, 700, 800, 1,000 times in a novel, and nobody will think of it at all because it's a word that you sort of read past. You know, nobody's going to count the number of thes or ands that you have in a novel, obviously. It's words that stand out that you typically, I mean, a word like Stygian, you, you can get away with that once. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can only use that word once. And, it's, I mean, that's an unusual word. It's not something in common parlance, but there are other words that even though you might hear them fairly regularly, they're still used seldom enough that they stick out. So you can't use them more than once in a novel. I'm, I try and be very, very aware of that. Fortunately, I also have editors and copy editors who can, can help me with that. But I try and be aware of that kind of thing. Adjectives, I, I have lots of fun, favorite, I mean, lots of adjectives that I love, but nothing in particular comes to mind. I think I probably, if there are words that I overuse, they probably tend to be verbs, not adjectives. Okay. That's, again, it's one of those questions where a lot of our listeners, they go, oh, I tend to overuse this word a lot. I'm like, you know what? It's not just you. Everybody tends to overuse a word every now and then. And because they have editors and things like that, they have the ability to overcome those things too. So, you know, it's interesting in a novel sometimes, my novels tend to be long, more usually more than 100,000 words. And and when you write 100,000 words, it's easy to repeat a couple. And but it's, it's not just a question of repeating it accidentally. You might write, it's not, and it's not just a question of words, it's actually, it could be whole sentences or, you know, right. the, or an idea. And if you write a novel and you get to a, a space early in the novel where something that you have to say, some detail you have to relate to the reader that they need to know, there comes a good place to tell that, you tell it. But then maybe you get a little farther along and you realize, oh, no, 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 this is the place to say that. And sometimes you go back and you delete the earlier one and you put the, the later one in. And that can happen several times throughout a novel where you keep saying, oh, no, no, this is the better place. This is the better place. Sometimes <laughs> you don't go back and change things, so you end up with several iterations of this throughout. At, at some point, you go back and you, you eliminate most, uh -huh. if not all but one of them. And then there are other times, too, where you've written something early in a novel, and late in the novel, you have to reintroduce it. Well, okay, how sure are you that the reader's going to remember what you've written? Do you need to reintroduce it? Is it now, have you repeated yourself? Now, is it is it something that the reader can go, oh, yeah, I already know this? It's tricky. It's very tricky. So, it's overuse is not just a word. It can be a sentence or an idea. It, even an idiom. An idiom. I tend to avoid idioms in Star Trek just because the idioms I know are 20th and 21st century idioms by and large. So I try not to use them because they always, for me at least, they ring false when I hear Captain Kirk or Captain Sisko or Captain Picard saying something that somebody would say in the 20th century. But I do like to try and adapt and uh, futurize idioms. I think that can be fun. I mean, there's a, a phrase, there, there are idioms like, that dog will hunt. Well, I, I changed that into, in one of my books, I changed that to, that starship will go to warp or something like that. I don't know, something like that. You know, I, I like to try and update them if it's reasonable to do that and if it sounds all right. I, like I don't it. know why. I just heard Tommy Lee Jones say, that targ won't hunt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is not one of our questions uh, before I get to the final of our Lipton questions, but because you said that you write long and, and you're a lover of the work, what do you think of J.J. Abrams describing that he didn't want Star Trek to be a talky geek fest like it had always been. He's entitled to their opinion. <laughs> He's so civil. He's a nice man. I know. I, I, certainly, I've, I've ruined your questionnaire by answering not with words, but by entire paragraphs. No. But James Swallow threatened me for one of them, so don't feel bad. You better. Well, you know, the, if, the, if, the, if the questionnaire is still going on, then there's still time. <laughs> there is one more. I was going to say, the, Nick, there is it, one more. Yeah. And this is the big one. Okay. If you were given the green light to kill a major Star Trek canon character, even if they've already been killed, who would you pick? Well, I've already killed canon characters. Are you asking me who I would kill because I don't like the character? No, we're asking you, no, even no. if you think that it would make a really great story, who do you think death would be a really great story? <sighs> And you said canon, so I can't even say, of course, I killed McCoy. No, I killed McCoy twice <laughs> in the same book. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, There's I... only one wrong answer to this question. It's been given already, so don't worry. <laughs> no, there is a wrong answer. To to me, for Nick. For Nick, if there is, yeah. Well, I'm going to give you the wrong, I'm going to give you an unsatisfying answer, because that's what I do.
the, the answer is whoever's death would serve the story I'm telling. And that, but that really is a genuine answer. There you go. I, I would have no problem killing anybody, depending on if the story warranted it. I mean, I killed Deep Space Nine. You could argue that's not a character. <laughs> that's a dude. That's a pretty big one, though. You know, <laughs> and I did kill McCoy, and I, I had intended for him to stay dead, but... That didn't quite happen, but uh, and not because people resurrected them; they just ignored what I'd written, which is fine because it, you know there are reasons for that, and I, and that's fine. But I can see, I can see good deaths for a lot of people. Here's a part of the problem: I also killed, uh, I, I've killed actually several canon characters. I killed the what's her name, the the Azette Burr, the Klingon daughter of uh, what's his face, the Dick of uh, uh, the Klingon Chancellor. Oh. Gorkhan, and she and she then later became. I killed her. I've killed canon characters before, but here's part of the problem in killing somebody, and particularly killing a well-known character. There's a tendency to want to give their death meaning, uh-huh. and so Tasha Yar died, and lo and behold, she's left a recording. Oh, isn't that convenient? Isn't that nice? Doesn't that tug at your heartstrings? Except. You know, for me, how fulfilling is that as a viewer, as a reader? How fulfilling is that? Because it just doesn't, it seems convenient, doesn't seem all that great. It, you know, so the alternative, though, is to give their death no meaning. Well, that's not really satisfying either. So what do you do? Where do you go? When I was in college, I took, I had a minor in writing, and, and I took a lot of writing courses. And even in grad school, I audited a lot of writing courses. And in all that time, I read one story that was worth a damn, and it, it wasn't even my own. And what I saw in a lot of stories was a tendency, and these were short stories, they weren't novels, they weren't extended pieces of fiction, but what young writers tended to do, and I, I was among them, they like to kill, they like to introduce characters in short stories and then kill them. But it was never satisfying, never, not once did I read a story where that was satisfying, and it wasn't strictly because they killed somebody, but you can't get to know somebody that quickly and to care enough about their death. But when you do get to know somebody really well, like our canon characters in Star Trek, you're stuck between giving them an unrealistically meaningful death and giving them a death that has no meaning. And neither one of those can, are, are particularly satisfying. I mean, Spock had a great death in The Wrath of Khan, I thought. And it was a terribly meaningful death. Except it really wasn't death, was it? <laughs> exactly. It, has, it carries with it its own frustrations. But even if you say that Spock's death was portrayed extremely well, how many times are you going to do that? How many characters is that going to be true for? The more you do it, the more it sort of dilutes the the impact of it. So I never strive to kill characters. I have stories in which their deaths become necessary because it serves the material. I've actually on several occasions been asked or allowed, told that I'm allowed to kill certain characters in Star Trek, and I never have, because it just didn't fit the stories that I was telling. Not that I had any aversion to it, other than does it serve the material. See, that's a wordy geek fest of an answer. Sweet. but That's, what, that's what our listeners love, trust me. Okay, well, the James Lipton questionnaire is supposed to have one-word answers, right? Not on this show. <laughs> no, not at all. You're allowed to expound. That's great. Nick, did we lose him? No, I'm here. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, and by the way, the only wrong answer is Esri Dax. Yeah. Ah, Nick's got to think for Esri. Yes, he does. Uh, I I wish I hadn't killed her in Revelation and Dust. Oh, dude! I don't believe you. Oh, come on. (laughs) It could be true. You never know. No, because... Spoiler or fake out. No. You've got to find the book Because one of the books is about the Aventine. Uh, Oh, Uh, Sam Bowers, right, yeah. Oh, oh. Love. Love. son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Nick. I'm messing with you. Probably. This is great. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, but you know, that's one of the fun things about the DS9 relaunch novels is I did not know anything about Esri being a cat. And when I picked up Destiny, so going back and seeing that transition was so much fun from counselor to command track to all of that was so much fun. Well, that is plenty of readers, I'm sure, would be happy to attest. There's some of that transition that's missing. Yes. There was a general consensus uh, that we needed to move Deep Space Nine forward to the quote-unquote current timeline. And so after telling stories in early 2377, suddenly we're in 2381. So there's four years of missing time, and that transition of Esri Dax, is some of that is in there. The Ascendance storyline is in there. 
And I'm hopeful that one day we'll get to see some of those stories in the in the literature. A, a final question I have for you, because you've written a great amount of Deep Space Nine. Now, Terry and I have a running disagreement, you could say. Just one? Uh, th- this is a big one. Terry is off her rocker and off her meds in her despisal of, go ahead, go ahead, say it, go ahead. Get it out. Get your huffing and puffing out. I don't her- huff and puff. I make a statement of my opinion, and you have yet to change like it. And and stuff. In what you leave behind, she hates what they did with Cisco. Uh. Okay. You hate what they did with Cisco. Why? Do you hate that they didn't outright kill him, or do you hate that he didn't yes. save? You wanted yeah. to put out. I mean, she also it, I, has a racial element to it. I do? The whole <laughs> black man leaving his children behind. Well, I thought that kind of sucked. I thought that that was a, a bit out of character, considering how much the man was so into it his family. that some... It wasn't out of character that he was sacrificing himself to kill Dukat. Oh. I'm just saying he either had free will or he didn't. And that's the whole problem I have with this issue, is he comes back and starts talking, going, gee, I'm sorry, I'm going to go be a god now. It was cheap. This can go on for hours. Would you say <laughs> that I hear right, you would have preferred if he had been killed, or you would have preferred? Absolutely. Okay. I actually- I, it would have been, it, to me, it would have been much more powerful. It would have been the first time a Star Trek captain had been killed. So the character was sacrificing himself. He didn't choose he to be didn't pulled die. by the prophets. He was going willingly to his death. The fact that the prophets pulled him in was not his doing. Can you guys let David uh, speak, please? <laughs> I think everyone wants to hear what he has oh, to say. That, that's fine. I, I'm interested in hearing what you guys think. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're, you guys are aware of, of Avery Brooks' role in that, yes? Yes, because Avery was concerned about a black man leaving his family on a primetime television show. And and there's some validity to that, I think. I agree. I mean, certainly he would be a man to speak on that in in his position as a as a viewer. And actually, as somebody who loved the character of Cisco, I think Ben Cisco is just a fantastic character. Ben Ben Cisco and Kieran Aries just love him. But as a viewer, I actually agree with Terry. I would have preferred to see Cisco die just because I think not having him die pulls punches. Having said that, I understand. I agree. I understand Avery Brooks's point of view and understand what they did, what they why they did what they did. The good thing for me, at least, is that that's because Cisco didn't die. That's actually allowed us to play with him in the novels, where otherwise we wouldn't have been able to. So that that's kind of fun for us. But you know what? What you leave behind, I thought, was a really terrific capstone for the series. A lot of people, a lot of the readers, complain about Deep Space Nine in the books that we've thrown the characters all over the universe, that we've sent them away from Deep Space Nine. Well, that wasn't us. They did that in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Odo right. was gone. Cisco right. was gone. O'Brien was gone. Worf was gone. I mean, all of these characters left Deep Space Nine. And, okay, so what do you do? Do you, do you bring them all back? That kind of seems a little bit artificial. I mean, to me, as a reader, it would seem a little bit artificial and Agreed. maybe not that satisfying. Or do you just go with what you've got? And Marco Palmieri and now Margaret Clark and Schlesinger have, have done a fine job. Marco really started the relaunch novels, the so-called relaunch novels of Deep Space Nine. I think that a fine job of exploring those characters that left, even if without bringing them back. We saw O'Brien on the O'Brien's on Cardassia, and we got to see Rom as the Grand Negus. They didn't come back, but we still get to see the character. And we created new characters like Elias Vaughn and Print Tenme to get so that the readers would get to know them and like them. And I and love her. I like her too. I loved Elias Vaughn. Loved the character of Elias Vaughn. And you know, really, the goal is to have characters that people relate to, that are somehow relatable to people, whether they relate to them or they just recognize them in some way. Terry, you said that you thought that Cisco, a sort of ascending to the temple, to the celestial temple, was not. You thought it was out of character for Cisco. No, I think that the problem is where Nick and I tend to argue a lot, and that is, it left me in a position of having to question whether or not he chose to move on or not. And if a character like Cisco, for the most part, 
I think that if he had been given the choice to stay with his family and, and his wife and his newborn baby, I think he would have absolutely, his character would have been, no, I can't be a god. I want to be a human with my family. I believe that that is solidly in character. So if he did make that choice, I think it was an out of character choice for him to stay with the prophet. I also happen to say, well, since that's kind of left up in the air as to whether or not he had a choice or not, to say that he was kind of, you know, taken by the prophets or whatnot. So I always think of it as, if I want to think well about the decision or him as a character at the end of the show, then I always say, okay, well, I'll rationalize it as he's being held captive by the prophets. <laughs> All right. See, and I've always approached it from the angle of he willingly threw himself over the cliff with Dukat. Which he did. Right. Because he thought he would die. He thought he would die. And the fact that he's in the temple, he did not ask them to pull him in the temple. They pulled him in there. Right. And with time being nonlinear, he could come back the next day. But he chose not to. And that's the problem. (laughs) How do you know? Time's not linear. I I think this is absolutely fascinating, particularly because (laughs) I, I love the character. I actually, I really... I think what Terry's saying to me is particularly interesting, but I have a different take on it than you do, Terry. Mm-hmm. I feel that if Cisco was given a choice between being with his family and his daughter hadn't been born yet, she wouldn't be born for several more months, or being with the prophets, I think it's a coin toss, and maybe not even a coin toss. Maybe he comes down in the favor of the prophets, and I say it for this reason. Cisco. In The Reckoning, an episode of Deep Space Nine, in The Reckoning, a prophet inhabited Kira Nerys, and a Pawraith inhabited Sisko's son, Jake. And they were going to battle. And they were going to battle to the death. And Sisko had the option of stopping that, but he didn't. He wanted to see the battle play out, and he was rooting for the prophet, meaning he wanted the prophet to destroy the Pawraith. He wanted Kira Nerys and the prophet that inhabited her to destroy the Pawraith that was inhabiting Jake. It doesn't sound like the best formula for <laughs> ensuring your son's survival. <laughs> <laughs> I bring that up because it demonstrates to me that Cisco. I absolutely have no doubt that he loved his family, that he loved his first wife, that he loved his second wife, that he he loves his son, that he loves his daughter now in the, in the novels. But he also, that he had essentially a higher calling. He may have been part prophet because the prophet inhabited the woman who actually gave birth to him. And he clearly listens to the prophets over and over and over again. There's, I'm trying to remember what the episode was, where Cisco has a potem far. He gets a shock in the uh, hollow suites and he's got some unusual brain activity that... Oh, that's the one where he finds Bahala, right? Yeah. Is that the one where he finds Bahala? I, I, you know, I, they blended together at this point. But yeah. my point in all of this is that Dr. Bashir tells him at some point that if we don't operate on you, if we don't fix this, you might die. And he says, yeah, sorry, this is more important. Trying to figure out the, the plan of the prophets and what they foresee for Bajor, that's more important to him than dying. Dying necessarily means leaving his son and leaving his then Fiance, I don't. I think they were fiance. So yeah, the, I think that he. Yeah, and I think that I think that episode right. was Rapture. Yeah. Rapture, right? So there we have in the series itself. We have examples of Cisco choosing between acting, sacrificing himself, right? Sacrificing himself, but acting on behalf of the prophets, or acting maybe actually on the behalf of the Bajorans through the prophets, but acting in a way that would not impact his family well. And he chooses the prophets time and again. I don't think it denies that he loves his family. I just think it demonstrates that the prophets' place in his life is really profound. And his place as the emissary is really profound. I love the journey that Cisco took. And I, too, as I say, would have preferred that he died just because it seemed a little wishy-washy that he was still around but wasn't. That seemed a little wishy-washy. I would have preferred one solid choice or the other. You know, right. they'd go retire to Bajor with his family. Right. Well, that's cool, too. And then, you know, we face that. We face in the books, we face this issue of, okay, so... Ben's come back from the Celestial Temple. Now he's no longer, he's not on Deep Space Nine anymore. He's basically on Bajor, kind of retired. He's with his wife and daughter. All right, well, that's kind of cool. And and they live happily ever after. That appeals to me as a reader, but it also 
is finite because then, well, okay, we got no stories going forward. So now where do you go with the character? And I, actually, I've tried to answer that in some of my books. I, I don't know. I find, I find it fascinating. I think Car- Cisco's arc is just a fantastic one. And but I, people, I told you at the beginning of the interview, I said that I've taken some grief for Rough Beasts of Empire, and it's because people yeah. think that Cisco acted out of character. And while he may not have done things that people wanted him to do because they loved the character, I absolutely maintain that he did not act out of character because he did the same things that he did in the book. He believed what the prophet in, in this series, he believed what the prophets told him. And, you know, it's not like the prophets are predicting things. They're they exist in all times. So they're saying, well, you know, you do this, this is what happens. Not because we're predicting it, because we've seen it. So it's not quite the same thing as, oh, this is what we're predicting. This is what we've already seen. No yep. linear time, all of that stuff. I don't know. It's fascinating stuff. I, I love the whole Cisco storyline. Very cool. Right on. Terry and I could go on with this forever. <laughs> this, this yes, whole, they can. This well, clearly whole, I too. Cisco, yeah, it's just so much fun. And, that you know, that's the Deep Space Nine. You know, what you leave behind to me, I actually, I'm pretty alone in this, I think. Or not alone, but I'm in the minority. I like it better than, what's the name of it? Um, all Good Things. All Good Things. But, again, that's my love of Deep Space Nine. You know, and I, I loved all good things, but I I really loved I, I really loved what you leave behind. You know, all good and, things is they, I mean they're different they're different animals. All good things basically yeah. says, hey, you know what? This is where we're at, and it's great. And Deep Space Nine says, hey, we've been changing since day one, and guess what? Tomorrow's changing too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was definitely it, a different perspective. They were both excellent episodes. They really were. As compared to the abortion that is Endgame. <laughs> I haven't been there yet. Don't worry. I, I know. I know. Spoiler alert. Yeah, oh, that's okay. No. I kind of know how everything ends. It's not like I don't know, but I have Greatest. not. At, you we know just what? started season six. so don't. At least these are the voyages. Didn't, you know, don't even get me started because Endgame yeah. was such a, thank God for Kirsten and the Voyager novels that she's writing because she, I love her Voyager universe. Speaking of good writers, she, uh, you know, one of the great things about going to Shorely for me was meeting Kirsten because we live maybe 15 or 20 miles apart. So we've actually become friends since then. And she and her family are just terrific. And she's, a hell of a writer, and, but she's also a hell of a nice person too. That's great. I have uh, one day I'll meet her. One day I'll get to meet her. Oh, she's a sweetheart. And, and she really know. is. Well, you were at her Bring Back Voyage Janeway panel, weren't you? I was, even though I didn't necessarily have a, a dog in that hunt. It is, <laughs> well, I can say that's the 21st century. I didn't have a lot. I knew what had happened with Janeway, but I. I didn't. I hadn't read some of the things. I was more interested. I, I had only just met Kirsten, but I was really interested to see how she would handle the whole issue. I just thought it was fascinating, and I watched her. I actually told her this afterward. I watched her answer questions, and I don't think she could have done a better job. She was completely honest and completely open and very eloquent in her discussion about what had happened, why it had happened, where they were going forward. I think it's particularly, and Kirsten hasn't said this, this is me talking, I think it's particularly galling for anybody who's not a sexist to be accused of sexism because they killed, and she didn't do this, but because they killed a female character, right? Or didn't bring back a female character who had been killed. You know, Kirsten is a woman, but Kirsten's a writer. And that's where it starts. I mean, I'm not a sexist. I would hate to be accused of that. But for a woman to be accused of that sort of sexism, just, I don't know, it's particularly galling to me. It just seems absurd because it's it's so far from being true. And I couldn't... In that panel, she could not have handled handled herself with greater aplomb. She was fantastic. And she's a fantastic writer, too. And if people don't know what David's talking about, you can go back. Kirsten, we were very, very honored and proud. Kirsten had uh, approached our show and let us tape that panel and put it on our po- on our podcast. Yep. So that, that panel is actually up on our, on our website. For those that uh, don't know what he's talking about, it was the Bring Back Janeway panel where people kind of voiced their concerns that, Janeway was dead, and how could she write Voyager novels without Janeway? And it, it, you're right, she was she was absolutely fantastic, and she, I, she was so nervous going into it, and she did such a great job. She didn't betray that nervousness, and I, I was particularly taken by her response to a woman who decided to voice her displeasure with Janeway being dead, despite the fact that she'd read none of the novels. Right. Uh, she she'd only been told that this had happened, so. 
I don't understand how important it is. Is it to you if you don't even read this stuff? Well, what do you what do you care that if it's an entertaining other people? Why you care since it's it's not that it's not entertaining you. It's that you choose not to even try, and which, which is a perfectly legitimate decision to make. And you're not going to read the great, but then why are you so invested in what's happening in the books? It just I don't know. It didn't make any sense to me. But Kirsten handled herself great. And I, it's, I didn't. I forgot that you guys had taped it. It's great that it's up because. She does such a good job in that in that panel. But isn't that one of the great things about Trek, though, is that somebody can love a character so much that they're that invested, even if they haven't taken the time to read the novels? Well, I don't know. I don't. I certainly, certainly that's not something that's only true of Star Trek. There are plenty of characters right. and plenty of things that you know, Harry Potter and whatever else. There are plenty of characters that are beloved the world over. I don't know. Certainly, I'm not going to tell. I would not presume. Yeah, to I, for to- some reason, I really don't see Jake. K. Rowling sitting in a panel for a Bring Back Fred issue. Well, I, I have no complaints about how Harry Potter, that last image of him riding away on the horse versus Hawkeye and BJ looked on. I thought that was the best goodbye to Colonel Not Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah, yeah. Uh, Colonel Potter, you silly man. Oh, but, 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 you know, I think characters are, yeah, people love characters, and I would not presume to tell somebody that they love a character too much or that they're too vested in it or whatever. All I know is I like being surprised. Yeah. I might want a character to go in a certain way, and it, when it, it goes in a way that I didn't want it to, I, I like that. I think it's kind of cool. I like to be surprised. I like to be, I like a writer who can do something I don't want them to do and then convince me that it was the best possible thing to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, even as a reader, I try and focus on this as a writer, but even as a reader, I want to, I want the story to to be king. I I want to be carried away. I want to be tr- transported, if you will. Well, we have taken far too much of your time from from your copy editing of the, the fall. And we cannot we appreciate thank, taking yes, the time. And we, we do can't appreciate thank you taking the time for joining us. Well, thanks and for having me. I, I certainly enjoyed it. For all and, of our listeners, again, the first book. In the series, The Fall comes out, according to Amazon, on August 27th. So you can pre-order now. And please do. (laughs) Pre-order as many as you possibly can. (laughs) As a matter of fact, do yourself a favor and do what I do, and that's you get the paperback from Mm -hmm. Amazon so you can support the G&T show by going to the Amazon thing over there on the right-hand side of our our website. And then I also have an iPad, so I uh, buy the book again through iTunes. And then I buy the book again for my Sony e-reader because... I never know. Um, they're like glasses for me. You know how people leave several gl- pairs of glasses around the house? <laughs> that, that's how I am with my books. So, You're my and I'm, reader. <laughs> oh, it's, I'm the same way. I have my Kindle. I order for my Kindle, and I also order the, the paperbacks so that my bookshelf looks really cool. My bookshelf have it really cool. That's exactly right. You know, it, it's this is self-serving, but it is, it is important to – I mean, that's great. It's important to support the books if you want the books to keep happening because you just you just never know. I mean, it, for Simon & Schuster, it's all about the bottom line. Yep. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that Deep Space Nine will continue, and, you know, the more Deep Space Nine novels – even if it doesn't say Deep Space Nine on it, Revelation Dust is really a Deep Space Nine novel. And there are certainly Deep Space Nine elements in Una McCormick's book, uh, The Crimson Shadow, and in Dave Mack's A Ceremony of Losses. So, you know, if you like Deep Space Nine, it's important to support those. And it's important, you know, not not to say that you shouldn't buy James and James Swallows and Dayton Ward's books either, but at that point, everybody will because it will be deep into the series and they'll want to know what happens. And those guys can write. <laughs> I feel very privileged to be with that lineup of, of writers. Just and you're the you're the leadoff batter. Yeah, which is nice. I, I actually like to bat leadoff, and I'm I'm speaking literally when I play baseball, which I I do a lot. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like to bat leadoff. Yeah, that, which has got its own interesting responsibilities because you have to set some things up and whatever. But it's it was an awful lot of fun, and these guys are great to work with. In addition to being great writers. Well, would you rather be leadoff than the finale of the series? Do you feel? that there's a greater pressure in doing, like, say, the sixth book of the series than there is the launch of it? It depends on the timing of the writing and how much time you've got to actually write it. Because if you're able to read all of the books that come before it while you're writing, then that makes it a lot easier than having to go from outlines because things change all the time and, you know, you want to try and stay consistent. I, I can say this. I mostly would like to do either the first or the last novels of series. One reason to do the first is, and if you do a little thought experiment, this completely makes sense. Sense, the first book of a series always sells the most. Yeah. Yeah. 
nobody who doesn't read the first is going to pick up the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. If they know that it's the second or third, you know, they're always going to start with the first one. And while you hope that everybody who buys the first one will buy each of the subsequent books, just as a as a reasonable expectation, not everybody will. Right. So that's a good reason to write the first book. But, you know, it's fun, too, to be able to set the stage. And I've got you know, a dramatic event in my novel that was oh. interesting to write. And um, well, what was that? I'm just now I'm all nervous again. You know, when people say if there's a, dr- a dramatic event, I'm like, oh, no, well, that's OK. She got worried when the I was novel, reading. There should be some drama in it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Terry got nervous when I called her. I was reading the second of the cold equations. And I said I had to put it down because of something that happened. And she was like, oh, great. I can't wait to look forward to that now. <laughs> <laughs> which which I'm just about to dive into. So got a lot of catching up to do because there's a couple of other books I haven't started yet, and it, which is bad. I'm usually up to snuff with everything, and I'm not. Well, Why? again, thank you so much for joining us. And if there's anything we can do, let, you know, when uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you again when the book comes out. That might be fun. Well, that yeah, would be, I would be able to answer questions more definitively, for sure. That would be good. We can follow up with it at uh, Shore Leave. I don't think I'm, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be at Shore Leave this year. I wish that I was, but they've got other writers that they're they're bringing in this year from uh, from the West Coast. So, any chance you'll be at Vegas? I don't think so. I don't think that. Yeah, I mean, certainly haven't been invited by me. <laughs> I could go on my own, but I tend not to do that. It's a different thing when you're writing these novels, you know. Yeah. Uh, I I don't like to spend uh, the money I make on them chasing down sort of other opportunities. I, I don't know. It's just kind of weird to me to to do that. I like, I, you know, I don't know. I probably I can't imagine being in Vegas. It's only not well, for that. They have a baseball tournament in Vegas, though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have fun when you do go. That's kind of it. I think we're ready to tie things up. Nick? I'm good, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mike, I hope your tooth feels better. Thanks, He's Nick. He's been chewing Thanks. on barat leaves there, trying to <laughs> dull the pain. Thank you, Terry. To you, too. Thank and you. Thank you once again to our special guest on this supplemental log, David R. George III. And you can look forward to his novels. And if you haven't read his older novels, get off your ass, click, read, enjoy, and uh, join us for the next G&T Supplemental. Mike. Kapla. There you go. Goodbye. Terry. Goodbye. Joel on true. Music for the GNT show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation. GNT show is a busy little beaver production.